Hi, everyone. My name is Steve Schwartz. I'm the founder of the LSAT blog, and today I'm very excited to be chatting with Dr. Charles Parker. How are you doing today, sir? Well, Steve, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining. So I came across you a little while ago, and I thought, finally, here's someone who can answer a lot of the questions that I can't answer. I get a lot of students asking about more mental aspects of exam prep, mindset, and then, of course, particularly, potentially, supplements, drugs, things of that nature. I mean, I want, to, I want to get into all of this with you, but just to start with, how can students reduce test day stress and anxiety? What are some techniques you've seen that work? Well, forgive me for being trite, okay, <laughs> and having a bit of a cliche, but preparation is the entire thing, and that's what we're doing here today, Steve, is really preparing for a very important test process, and, you know, Having been through that whole testing process professionally, there are many preparatory um, activities that a person can do in terms of just test preparation. Forget the content and the information that you should know, but there's the whole preparation for taking the test that I'm a strong advocate of. I think it works out very well, people who do it. Even if they do it twice, their overall level of self-confidence is going to uh, appreciably increase with the practice and the understanding of what that test is all about and what they can expect. One of the problems with testing, one of the big problems of testing, is just the whole anticipation of what you don't know, what you will ask, and what they will ask, and what you will do with what you don't know. How do you actually respond and carry through even though those test questions come up that you really don't have the answer for. So, so it's kind of coming down to the to making that ambiguous fear and anxiety, making it more concrete through your understanding of the exam content and kind of mentally walking through the exam. Is that kind of where you're going with so this? True. Uh, so true. And I think even coaching is helpful, you know, because I think it depends on what the experience of the person is. If they're doing uh, that high level of testing, They've been through a variety of different tests before, even uh, SATs, that sort of thing. So they have an idea of longer tests, but I think the one issue is all the tests, like the MCATs, for example, over on the medical side, uh, a person really does, if they're prepared, they're just better ready to go into it. It's just that simple. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. And a lot of students these days are applying for testing accommodations to maybe get extra time on the exam or get some other special considerations. I'm wondering about walking through students through that process. How do you typically evaluate students for things in particular like ADHD? What, what goes into that? Well, here's the thing, uh, Steve. As you know, we have uh, been very opinionated and thoughtful about ADHD for many years. I mean, uh, one of the problems that I think that goes on with uh, ADHD is that in fact, it's a, uh, for one of a better expression, dance card diagnosis. It's a fashion show diagnosis. And a lot of the people who are listening intuitively know that because they're like, hey, it's not a big deal. I mean, I can take these stimulants. I mean, the whole thing of what's going on in secondary education with stimulants is is pretty amazing. And I think one of the reasons there's so much irresponsibility going on with the diagnosis and with the use of medications in general, forget the test itself, I'm talking about the overall big picture, is, is the fact that the diagnostic criteria are so ridiculously amorphous. So, you know, Steve, you know as well as I do, if a person is uh, hyperactive or inattentive, it's a visual, it's an appearance, it's a behavioral diagnosis, not a brain function diagnosis. And what your listeners need to think about, what your blog readers need to think about, is what am I actually dealing with internally, not what am I, what am I dealing with externally? And that's something we can really elaborate a little bit on. I'll just take a moment of your time on this, because how a person looks, as you know very well, is not who they are, okay? They can, now, if a person's a quote-unquote flamer who has an obvious deterioration, then they will be uh, 
able to be identified pretty quickly and they're struggling and they've probably already been identified and taken some medication to deal with hyperactivity or inattentiveness if it's obvious. The problem that so many individuals have because of the inadequacy of the diagnostic coding system, and it is painfully inadequate, uh, they don't really know what their problem is, you know, because they're bright in many aspects of their lives. They're great conversationalists. They can read the things that they're interested in, but when it actually comes down to organizing their thoughts and putting things down on paper and actually staying focused over a period of time, they can have a problem oftentimes, and you'll get a kick out of this, oftentimes because they're thinking too much, not that they have a deficiency, but that they have a cognitive abundance. They're thinking too much. And so what happens is sorting, when you go into a test like this, by far the greatest, the most predominant presentation of executive function challenges, which is the new word for ADHD. ADHD is really, in my opinion, 20 years out of date. I mean, and, uh, you know, the why is it out of date? Because the science, the neuroscience activities are based on brain function, and everybody that's on the internet that's talking about it, discussing it, every single person from Dr. Ned Hollowell on down, the guy who wrote Driven to Distraction years ago, uh, Russell Barkley down in University of South Carolina, all the guys are really looking at brain function diagnosis and di uh, brain function diagnostic criteria rather than um, appearances. Now, let's just take a moment to tease that point apart a little bit. So a person can say to themselves as they're listening and thinking about what we're talking about here, what is my problem? What you know, I'm not hyperactive. I'm, I am yeah, a little impulsive once in a while. I mean, if I drink a little too much, I can get pretty rowdy. But that's not my, I'm, that's not my problem every day. I do really well in most things. But I really do have a thing of completing tasks. Now, one of the things that I think is so important is that we actually, since we're looking at brain function, is we look at executive function, which is the way a person actually thinks rather than the way they behave. So one of my constant reminders is that folks were treating thinking problems. This is international. This isn't just you and me in Brooklyn and Virginia Beach. This is what's going on in the world globally. We're treating thinking problems, my friends, without thinking about thinking. This is, this is abhorrent in my opinion. So and this, is, oh, I'm sorry. No, please dig right in. I was just going to ask, so what you're saying is that if this is a external behavioral problem for a lot of students and they're treating it with medication, that seems to be a bit of a disconnect where they're not really treating the actual issue. Is that, is that where you're going that, with this? Well, I will take one step. You're, it's an excellent question. Uh, it is slightly a disconnect in the sense that the targets are somewhat helpful. That's why I said inadequate. So a person who takes meds for behavioral uh, uh, disparities, for hyperactive or inattention, it can actually help the person control those two behavioral traits. But the other additional secondary benefit is that it should adequately control and help and assist and support the thinking process. And most of the time it does. So, so as a result, uh, a lot of those folks are treated adequately and sufficiently because they're actually uh, able to manage the thinking process. Let me uh, answer it a different way, and that is, so what are the targets of thinking if we're really looking at thinking? Well, disorganized thinking has three different things going on. One is the poss possibility of acting without thinking. That is the behavioral part. But the other two are thinking, thinking, thinking without acting. This is the most frequently missed subset in the entire universe of executive function. And I call it attention abundance disorder <laughs> because a person has so much on their mind. And if they've really prepared, they've got a thousand things on their mind. How can I get it organized to do the job on the test? So that attention abundance disorder is a manifestation that is 
uniformly missed. I mean, I can't tell you, I've done thousands of second opinions. Person comes in, we go over their, their whole thing. And first of all, the medication hasn't been adjusted correctly, which is a whole nother heartburn, which I won't bother you with unless you have some specific questions about it because it's so easy to do. But more than that, they haven't been targeted in terms of what they're trying to fix. So they still suffer from unmanageable cognitive abundance and they haven't actually pulled their thoughts together in some orderly way. And the second one that's missed, neither of these are in the diagnostic, the current DSM-5. They're not in the current DSM-5. Uh, the second one is um, avoidance, uh, which really is uh, interpreted over to procrastination. So what happens is the timing is off. If a person is thinking, thinking, thinking without acting, then they have the additional presentation of I'm not going to think, I'm not going to act, I'll get it to in a minute, give me a break, I'll talk to you later. Well, that whole avoidance thing in the outdated dance card diagnostic system is called a personality disorder of all things. I mean, can you imagine that? Avoidant personality. And so all these individuals that have these different problems then wind up um, – uh, than not being treated correctly. Uh, you know, I hear the binging in the background and I realize that I didn't turn my email off and I'm turning it off, Steve, so you won't have to hear the bonging in the background. I it's okay, no problem. So, but um, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's really a very key point because then if your listeners have a clear target, they're much more likely to be, be firmly adjusted in the medication uh, adventure that they're on or they can then identify that, hey, they, they do need some help because they do have unmanageable cognitive abundance, which I loosely term cognitive anxiety, which is mental anxiety, as a dis in distinction to affective, emotional, somatic feeling anxiety down in your chest or your stomach. So chest and stomach anxiety is a different neurotransmitter system entirely, mainly serotonin. Whereas cognitive thinking, worrying, fretting, analyzing, disorganization, that is predominantly dopamine, which is then treated by the stimulant medication. So that's a quick gotcha. breakdown on targets. Well, thank you for that, that breakdown. It's really helpful. So we've got, in particular, I'm interested in talking with you about the procrastinators, where you said it's more emotional and there's some things going on in the gut, so to speak. And then we have the people who think and think and think without acting. I can see both of these issues coming up a lot for students taking the LSAT, those who never get around to studying because they can't bring themselves to do it because of anxiety. And then we have people who get bogged down and they keep overthinking LSAT problems without actually being able to choose an answer and let go and move on. So I'm interested yeah. in, your recommendations, either medication related or non-medication related for how to handle this? Okay. Well, let's first of all, once a person identifies the fact that they do have an encumbrance, they have too much going on cognitively, the medication array is, is remarkably deep. I mean, the opportunities are terrific. And you know as well as I do, and it was in some of the remarks that you had in the uh, preparation for this conversation, people do abuse medications. They use medications capriciously. Hey, let me borrow a little of this and see how it goes and do whatever. Now, uh, just to quickly address that point, I think that medications uh, do help. They are quite uh, useful if you know what you're doing. And there are two things you have to know what you're doing. One is what the target is that you're shooting at, this makes it's totally common sense. What is the target you're shooting at? What do you want to correct? And then how do you actually dose the medication effectively so that you have a predictable outcome and you don't walk into that LSAT with like 52 pickup because you did, you know, too much medication at the last moment and you took it on this and you, and you had no awareness of really what was going on. And by the way, you forgot to have breakfast, so that blew you out the top of the window. And then you're in there trying to, you can't actually think because the medications have actually distorted your perceptions of what's going on, which everybody on this call knows you can do if you take the medications incorrectly. So 
to answer your question in a more succinct way, if a person has a problem, my absolutely firm, strong recommendation is, number one, find a professional who knows what they're doing. If they're going to, don't get your family practitioner. Most family practitioners, I love them to death. They, they, they're great because we work together as a team. They'll take my advice. But they'll like, hey, try this. Let me know if it works. I'll talk to you later. They don't have any internal criteria about what's expected in the medication. And to just hit the medication expectation thing a little bit, if the presentation of the individual is thinking without acting, or I'm not going to think, I'm not going to act, I'll get to it in a minute, I got too much on my mind right now, just a second, let me think about this, let me think about that, I can't decide right now. Either one of those two presentations, which are by far the most prominent presentations in all of executive function land, Hyperactive is not the main presentation, my friends. So if you get those two guys squared away, then the only way you can do that is to get the correct medication. Not every medication works the same way for everybody. The complexity of this is uh, a problem because human beings are all different. I mean, Steve, I'm different from you. You're different from me. You might be able to take one medication. I couldn't take that same medication because you just have a different somatic complex. Your brain is different. Your body is different. We don't know what your liver is going to do with the medication. We don't know what my liver, my brain is going to do with that medication. So we have to be respectful of every single person that's taking a medication. Be clear on target recognition. And here's what one should expect. And I'm going to summarize this. I've got it on uh, a number of different um, modules. I mean, the, the easiest thing for a person, if they want to if I'm going too fast for them, just go over to my YouTube channel because I've got it. I've got more videos than anybody in the country out there on how to do this. So, you know, if you, if you get swamped with this, just go to it's uh, the uh, channel over there is DR, Dr. Charles Parker, all one word. And you just go right over there and take a look at it and work your way through. I've got the playlist set on the, on the front page so you can actually see what the diagnosis is see what you're actually treating from a diagnostic point of view, then getting the dosage right, and then looking at the different impediments that would interfere with the dosage. It's all spelled out there, black and white. It's all complimentary. It's sitting out there on YouTube. But to summarize it real quickly for your listeners, each of the medications has a specific, because they are stimulant medications, they have a specific duration of effectiveness, DOE, that should work well. And that is how you stay within the boundaries and the parameters. What happens is if your body or my body is metabolizing the medication on some kind of an odd rate, which makes it either too fast or too slow, uh, a too fast metabolism would require more medication because it's all going to dissipate so quickly. A too slow uh, uh, metabolism would mean a little bit would take you longer than it should. You have to be very careful to keep the dose low so you don't blow the person out the top of the therapeutic window. So that therapeutic window has different characteristics. It can be very like a very narrow therapeutic window based on metabolic disarray. A little bit doesn't work and a little more is too much. That's a narrow therapeutic window. You can have what's called a roving therapeutic window. You get the medication on board, and it worked this way today, but it works differently tomorrow, and then it works differently the next day. And you have an unpredictable where you feel like, pardon the, pardon the metaphor, but you feel like you're chasing your tail out in the woods, like a, like a hunting dog. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't find out where you are. I mean, you know, I think there are rabbits out here in the woods, but I'm so busy chasing my tail, I don't know what's going on. So that whole duration of effectiveness is a big thing, and I'll just say a couple of quick words about it. The extended duration of the extended medications, the uh, XR medications, do obviously, quite obviously, that's why they call them extended release, they last longer. And they last longer because they're built to last longer, and if you want me to tell more about that, we can talk about that in a minute. The immediate release is in my opinion, a great place to start 
because then you can tell what's going to happen with the duration. Now, if a person were to capriciously take a medication before they went into the LSAT, like, hey, you know, all this stuff, I, I don't know if I've got it or not, but I sure know if I take a stimulant medication, I can get, I can get do pretty well. Well, that's fine. The only problem is my strong recommendation is they have some clear awareness before going into the LSAT what the duration of effectiveness of that medication is for them or else they'll go in there and they'll be in there for two or three hours and then they'll be out the window because they had a good duration for what would be the extent, the immediate release is about three to four, five hours maybe, but the test's longer than that. And, and so then you have to figure out what the, what the dosage is, what the duration of effectiveness is. You want, as a person, you want to go in prepared. That's why I say get a good, get a good person who knows what they're doing, a professional, help you dial it in correctly for your body metabolic rate. And then you'll go in there and you don't have to worry about it. Am I going to live or die? Maybe this thing's not going to work. Maybe it will work. I don't know what's going on. And you won't feel so preoccupied and be distracted by what the medication itself is doing because you'll have some preparatory activities already in your, under your belt. So this is something what you're saying is you'd want to test it out hopefully at least a couple of times before the actual LSAT test date and you'd want to calibrate the dosage specifically for someone with your unique metabolism and characteristics. And so your YouTube playlist or consulting with a professional such as yourself, not the general practitioner, in order to get a sense of what's going to be right for you. I'm hearing from you that everyone's kind of different with this and it's on a, it's on a one size fits all. It is absolutely true. What you said is absolutely true. And it's really that everybody is different. I'm, I approach every single person that walks in my office as a completely brand new clean slate. No matter, they can be enormously overweight. They can be morbidly obese. They can be skinny as a rail. They can be nine years old. They can be 65. All of those uh, assumptions that people make based on body size, age, in fact, people make assumptions based on gender, are out the window, out the window. Every single person must be customized because if they aren't, they will be surprised. And I know because I've surprised myself so many times. <laughs> <laughs> what about things like caffeine or nicotine, things that are over the counter, you read it, you're used by a lot of people? What are likely to be the consequences of starting or stopping caffeine or nicotine use before an exam or during an exam? Well, first of all, starting it, uh, again, we have the same admonition there. Uh, if a person is going to use, Nick, uh, back up, uh, if somebody's going to use caffeine, which is uh, clearly a more of a stimulant effect than the nicotine would be. And nicotine is going to be in and out of your system. And, uh, you know, you may feel good for maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, but you're not going to have a a morning of it. Uh, caffeine, each person is going to, with caffeine, is going to have the same thing they're going to have with whether it's uh, Ritalin or uh, Adderall or Vyvanse. It doesn't matter what the product is. The product is going to have a specific way that it's metabolized in that person's body. For example, I'll just give you one other quick thing. Not commonly appreciated by the public is the fact that each liver, your liver and my liver, have different specific pathway sizes. It's like, it's like a conduit. And so let's just take cytochrome P450 2D6, which is a conduit, which is a liver pipeline for amphetamine products. You could genetically have one that's tiny and small, and I could have one that's the size of a house. Well, if my conduit, if my 2D6 pipeline is large, I'm going to need more medication and it's going to run for a shorter period of time. If yours is uh, exquisitely narrow, you're going to need less medication and it's going to run for a longer period of time. And you really have to be careful dialing in both of those people. It's not like that the narrow pipeline is going to be more attention. Both of them require attention because 
you have to really know what's going on with that person to make a proper uh, prescription and, and uh, diagnosis and treatment plan. Again, so it's personalized once again. Yes, sir. Let me ask you another one. This one's a bit more niche and unique, but rising in popularity, uh, a lot of people are microdosing psychedelics in the hopes of thinking outside the box or thinking more creatively. I haven't really, aside from the fact that this is illegal and maybe not something that future lawyers should be <laughs> doing, I'm wondering about, you know, for those who aren't going to listen anyway and might be prone to trying this, what are some of the potential consequences? I haven't really been compelled by the evidence that I've seen. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I don't have uh, really any significant clinical evidence on this. I've listened to um, a number of people, however, and I'm really quite interested in it. I listened to a uh, podcast with um, um, in Philadelphia, um, the NPR podcast in Philadelphia is, is skipping my mind right now, but she interviewed Michael Pollan. And if you just Google Michael Pollan podcast, um, he has written a book on the whole thing with uh, really psilocybin, hallucinogenic. And I think the thing about that one is it changes the way you think, but doesn't really help you with the organization process. I think, you know, my own, from what I know, and I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but from what I know, I would stay the heck away from creative thinking and uh, who am I going into an LSAT. On the other hand, I would really want to be buttoned down, nailed down. I'd nail one foot to the floor. I want to know exactly who I am going in there. And I want to know as much as I can about uh, taking the test um, uh, in the most informed way. And that's going to be more of a cognitive uh, activity. Definitely. No. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. Michael Pollan's book is, is great. I've actually read it and I've listened to some podcasts as well. Very interesting stuff, but I'm not sure it really applies to taking a standardized exam like the LSAT where you need to have regimented thinking and you definitely want to know who you are. Yeah, that's good if you're a lawyer and yeah. you're trying to decide <laughs> what you want to do as a lawyer. Are you going to save the world? That's a whole nother question. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you for that, Dr. Parker. So <laughs> What other advice would you have for students right now going into an exam, whether they have ADHD or not, if they think they might have attention issues or difficulty focusing? Any, any words of wisdom or recommendations for them at this point? Yeah, well, I, and, and some of these are going to be a little bit on the cliche side, but, you know, I think the issue is because the cognitive anxiety is a form of anxiety, a person really does want to uh, relax and stay relaxed and breathe deeply. I know when I was doing my board exams for, for psychiatry uh, back in whatever, 1969, something like that, a long time ago, and I'd studied hard and I'd done the whole preparation for the boards and so on, and I was at the uh, Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital. They, it was a memorable occasion, and I was in there and I was – uh, I, I was really well prepared. I had, a, I had a great residency. Uh, the whole thing was, I was totally, totally prepared. And I got in there and I was nailing it. I'm like, you know, somewhere in the course of, uh, probably had about an hour to go. And I was like, I passed this thing. You know, <laughs> it hit me. <laughs> I, I passed it. And I had, a, uh, it took me a while to bring myself back into even reading a sentence because I was so relieved that I was on top of the material, and yet I had a big section of material that I hadn't, uh, hadn't completed, to tell you the truth. So what I did was what I'm telling you. I just had to take a deep breath, had to relax, say, okay, I got more, more of this test to do, and, I, and stand back from the whole thing, as opposed to burrowing and, and you know, attacking every question. I breathed deeply and got myself relaxed, went back and read it and finished the test and ultimately passed it. But, but that was an interesting thing in terms of cognitive anxiety in the test process. So it's sometimes as simple as simply taking a moment, taking a deep breath, knowing you've got this, and then moving on. Yeah, I mean, you can, it can get that simple. I mean, I yeah. think being relaxed, I, I, apropos of that, that point, 
there is a lot to be said. We've interviewed a number of really cool professionals at Core Brain Journal on the whole value of meditation. You know, if a person says, well, you know, this whole medication thing. Now, uh, most of the informed students nowadays are like, really, give me anything. Let me get this thing done. But, but if a person wants to do something else and really kick it another step down the road, practicing meditation is, is not frou-frou and woo -woo. It's not, it is totally a reasonable thing to do because it would give a person a sense of internal um, sustenance. They have a internal sense of authority and power over the material and comfort that they're not going to, you know, they're going to be able to do well. They have, they have, they're in connection with themselves through meditation as opposed to, I don't know who I am. Can I pass this? I don't know. You know, you know, and, and instead of going into it in cognitive disarray, they, that meditation portion would be helpful. Yeah, in a way, meditation is kind of like a focus training. I think about it as the moment where you notice your mind wandering, that's the moment of growth where you're strengthening it like a muscle. And you can apply that same practice to if you're thinking and thinking and thinking, but you're unable to break out of that loop and then take action. Yeah, because it builds your self-confidence. I mean, yeah. when you actually like, for example, when I took my deep breath in that moment in, in Institute of Pennsylvania Hospital, and I had my sense of, okay, I, and I'm back on it, then my sense of self-mastery obviously improved and my self-esteem improved because, okay, I'm not crazy here. I'm going to be able to get this thing done. Yeah, excellent. Well, I want to be respectful of your time, Dr. Parker, but this has been enormously helpful. Now, I know you've mentioned a few resources and links. What's the best way for students to reach you or to, to find your material? I know you mentioned a playlist. Well, I think the I think just the YouTube channel is we're very busy over there, and if they're at all interested in this uh, whole cognitive process, that's a big one. That's at YouTube, and and uh, you know Dr. Charles Parker is the channel over there, and you know we we'd appreciate it if they come in, and we like comments. I'm every day I'm answering comments and questions on YouTube, and the other one that is a very active, uh, you know, where we have almost three hundred leading world authorities. I, one of my things that your, your uh, audience doesn't fully appreciate probably is the fact that um, I'm a strong proponent of, of educating the public so that they know what's going on and with the evolution in neuroscience. I think what happens is professionals uh, surprisingly, surprisingly don't know what's going on because when I was younger, what we used to do is, the <coughs> pardon me, the uh, pharmaceutical companies would pay. Let me get a quick drink here. Sorry. <coughs> I'm getting too excited being self-promotional. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we used to have the, the uh, pharmaceutical companies would send people out and they do speaking engagements on the evolution of psychopharmacology. No one is doing that now. There are a sea of individuals out there, internal medicine specialists, pediatricians, family practitioners, indeed psychiatrists, who really don't have any idea of what's going on with the evolution of uh, cognitive disarray and what to do with stimulant medications. So that's why every single person listening to this needs to get in and go through those doggone videos because they'll be as on it as anybody is in the country because the issues there, and it's, this is not me trying to build my numbers. I got plenty of numbers on YouTube. I'm just saying I know what's going on in the community, and that's the reason I've done so many of these videos because everyone's a little nuanced, and if you think about it, then you're informed, and then you can shop up a provider uh, intelligently. You know, you can tell whether the provider – if they're asking you amorphous questions, like, you know, is it working? How do you feel? You know, uh, without giving you clear objectives of what should be expected with the medication, you are in a not good situation when that happens. The, the, the professional needs to give you a clear idea of what's going on. And so that you can then, as a participant, as a partner in the healing process, 
you can really nail it down well and, and, uh, and communicate effectively with the treatment team. Awesome. Thank you for that, Dr. Parker. So what I'm hearing is educate yourself, take control of your own life and control of what you're doing. And a great place to do that and to get started is to watch these videos, these modules. I'll link to the YouTube playlist and your site in the description below this video. Again, for those who don't know me, I'm Steve Schwartz, founder of the LSAP blog. Dr. Parker, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Steve, thank you very much. Fun, fun talking to you, buddy. Same. Take care.